calming your fellow. And God says that it certainly left a sign, a clear evidence for people who use her reason. And I found here the way this, the verse is phrased quite fascinating. It says that God has left clear signs for those to perceive, but he uses it in a collective sense. The calming Yapalu, it is for those people, that tribe, that nation, that collective group which uses reason. The point that I'm trying to make here is that while individual reasoning is encouraged as part of spiritual growth, as part of enlightenment, God also speaks of reason in a collective sense. So how are we to use reason collectively? And we use our reason collectively through our public actions, through our institutions, through our politics, through our struggles for social justice. That is where we must use our public reason. That is where we must recognize that these two aspects of faith, which is a belief in God that comes from the heart and a use of reason that comes from the brain, so to speak, is essential. You cannot separate one from the two, which also is another way of looking that you cannot separate the realm of ibadat from the realm of muamalat. So you cannot be spiritually private and publicly inactive. <coughs> We cannot be intelligent, thoughtful, and rational in matters of spirituality alone without using the same apple, the same reason publicly. In Surah Al-Imran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says something very similar but in a slightly different way. I have talked about it before extensively from this member, so I will only briefly remind us, all of us about these two ayahs from Surah Al-Imran. In which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Inna fi khalqi samawati wal ardi wa ikhtilafi al-layli wa nahari la ayatil li ulil al-daa. Indeed, in the creation of the heavens and the earth, indeed, in the rotations of the day and the night, there are signs for those who understand. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is actually making for those who are scientists here an empirical argument. He says, look at this creation that I have created. Heavens and the earth, this is a really terrible translation of the Quranic ayah. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we call this samawat, wal earth, when he's talking about wal earth, it doesn't necessarily mean earth, it is everything that is materially existence. And when he's talking about samawat, it is the realm of spirituality, the realm in which angels and God and heaven. And so God has created these two realms and he expects that we reflect upon this. And he says there are signs in this for those of us who are Ulul al -Bab. So who are these people, Ulul al -Bab, the people of understanding? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then proceeds in the very next verse to define who these people of understanding truly are. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Al-lazina yaskuruna Allah qiyamahu wa quudahu wa ala junubihim wa yatafakkaruna fi khalqi samawati wal ard. Rabbana ma khalaqta haza baqidan subhanak faqina azabanna. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying these people, these people of understanding, these people who use their reason and their akhl are the ones who remember God while standing, while sitting, and while lying down on their side. So what he's saying is that people of understanding, people who use their reason are constantly aware of the presence of God. It does not necessarily mean that you have a tasbi in your hand and you're constantly doing zikr. Zikr of Allah can be understood by trying to conceptualize the opposite, which is the ghafla, to be, to be someone who has forgotten for a moment that there is a God. So the whole idea in this verse is saying that you remember God constantly. It doesn't mean that you sit down there and chant His name and disconnect yourself from the world that you live in. That is not the point. The idea is to be constantly aware of the presence of God. While I was driving here, I was trying desperately to think of an example as to how to explain to you to be constantly aware of the presence of God without chanting. And just, I just remembered a very simple example. Sometimes I go this long distance driving and either my wife, my son or my daughter is sitting with me in front of the car and they usually sleep. But I'm the one who's driving. Sometimes I'm listening to music. Sometimes because they need to sleep, I'm just reflecting on things. Even though I don't look at them sometimes for hours, and they are sleeping and they're not speaking to me, I am constantly aware of their presence. And to me, the most comforting thought is that I'm not alone in the car. 
And that is what being aware of God's presence is, that you are never alone in this world and recognize that. So God is saying that those who believe are those who do zikr all the time. But he adds something to it. He says not only are those who do zikr, while they are remembering me, they are reflecting on my creation, reflecting in this world. And it doesn't necessarily mean from just the shy perspective. Even if you are a scientist, you are reflecting on how the gravity works. The Nobel Prizes are being announced. If you go and read the three American scientists who got the Nobel Prize for Physics, look at their discovery. It is so fascinating. It tells you the secrets of God's creation, about the nature of the universe, The space is not straight and curved, something that Albert Einstein claimed 100 years ago has now been proven correct. So this, this is also a form of flicker on God's creation. So God is saying that people of understanding are those who have these two attributes, who remember God, are aware of God, and also reflect and use their reason in the created realm of God. And use this reason in a collective sense, in a public sense, and not in a private sense. So you're not limiting the use of aql to the realms of ibadat or personal piety, <coughs> but you're also bringing it into the realm of muamalat and realms of siyasa also. And that is an important part. So today I want to submit to you that perhaps the true believer is one who combines these two and manifest them by not only reflecting, but articulating and pursuing the common good. So what is the common good? Or in another word, what is public interest? Muslim scholars have come up with this concept of maslaha or maslaha mursala. Maslaha basically means public interest. Maslaha mursala means unrestricted public interest. This comes from the Maliki school of thought, which had a concept called Ishtasla. So it is if it's very similar to Ishtihad. Ishtihad is a comment or a, a process where you think about what is the right thing to do when both the Quran and the Hadith or Quran and Sunnah have not spoken. For a very simple example, there's nothing in the Quran which says thou shall not smoke pot. And there is no hadith which says thou shalt not smoke pot. But does it mean you can? No, the answer is no. Certainly not, young fellows. Even if it is legal, you are not allowed to smoke pot. And how do you do this? It's through the process of which they have. You go back and say, why did God forbid alcohol? You forget. Because it's not alcohol that is forbidden, it's intoxication that is forbidden. So anything that intoxicates you is forbidden. And if smoking pot intoxicates you, then that is also forbidden. This is how you do which they have. But this is a specific application of the practical side of ishtihad. Maslaha is the philosophical argument as which justifies the use of ishtihad. And clearly, it is not there in the Quran. There are attempts to extract, and I will give you one or two examples from the Quran, and you will realize that they are not exactly the verses which you would have thought validate and justify the use of the concept and the practice and the approach of maslaha to Islamic law. However, the biggest example that Muslim scholars have given of the correct and justifiable use of the concept of public interest is the creation of the Khulafah. So as soon as Prophet Muhammad sallallahu died, we know that the, the Caliphate came into existence, Abu Bakr Siddiq, Abu Alam Anhu became the first widely guided Caliph. There is no precedent. There is no command from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam on how to do it and what to do, what to call it, and there's nothing in the Quran. So how did this come about? Instantaneous ishtihad. Later on, Umar, if Ibn Fadr, radiallahu anhu, later on talks about it, that it just happened, and he was tossed over, he said it just happened. He was implying that there was divine guidance there, but nevertheless, this happening of this instantaneously, it happened because a significant majority of companions who were there recognize that the common good can only be pursued by the creation of an institution, 
like the Halakha. There are many other examples. For example, the most controversial aspect of Maslaha is the claim by scholars who advocate Maslaha. Uh, all three schools of Hanafi school of law, uh, of the Sunni school of law, with the Hanafi, Maliki, and Hanbali, subscribe to the idea of Maslaha. Even Abdul Wahab, the founder of what is now called Wahhabism, also resorted to the arguments based on Maslaha. <coughs> it's the Shafis who are very reluctant, but they also accept Maslaha in a slightly restricted fashion. So, the most controversial aspect of this concept of Maslaha is the belief that the pursuit of common good is so important and so significant and so necessary that we can even suspend the direct Nas from the Sharia sources in pursuit. So, for example, if there is something in the Quran which specifically says do X, Y, Z, and there is something in the Hadith literature which explicitly says very clearly, unequivocally, there's no doubt about it, says do X, Y, Z. But if you perceive that at that moment in time it is against the public interest, then you can pursue what is in the public interest and suspend what is ordered in the religious text explicitly. And the example that is often cited by scholars who defend this is when Hazrat Umar suspended uh, the Hajj punishments during a famine. So the Hajj punishment, as you know, is you cut out the hand of the thief, and Hazrat Umar suspended that during a period of famine. So what he did was he used the philosophy of Maslaha, public interest, to suspend the specific commandments of the text. There is no other way you can explain why he did that. <coughs> and how did he do that? What is the Shara'i justification for that particular judgment? He did not abolish it. He temporarily put a moratorium on that particular hard punishment because of the context we live in. Later on, Imam al-Ghazali in the 11th century consolidated this concept and essentially said, he did something very fascinating, he tied it to the Makasid of Sharia. And uh, a lot of scholars since then have been saying that the purpose of Islamic Sharia, the reason why God revealed these divine laws, is to protect five things. So the purpose of Islamic Sharia, the Makasid of Islamic Sharia, is to protect five things. The first and the fourth is Deen, and then life, Mal, that is your wealth, your nasab, which is your family, your relation, etc., and akhir. So the five things that the Sharia of Islam protects is life, property, association, uh, akhir, and religion. Now these are the five things. So an Imam al Ghazali argues that there are three ways in which you can protect them as a zaruriyat or hajiyat or tahsiniyat, as something that is necessary, something that is needful, and something that can be embellished. For example, in order to make sure that everybody's religion is protected, we will need to have a constitutional belief that there is such a thing as religious freedom. That would be the maslaha, the common good that people would do. So the way you protect people's religion is by giving them freedom to practice their faith. That would be under the Ruhiyat. But if you want to also talk about desires, you could come up with specific laws saying that in the month of Ramadan when people are fasting, <coughs> no company, no employer can prevent Muslims from working while they are fasting. So if you see that's a broader principle where you protect religion, then you get to specific laws to protect specific. And then you could also come up with a law and say, that uh, Muslims are encouraged to give charity. So we will pass a law which says that those who give zakat, their zakat will be exempted from taxes, which is a way of the state encouraging. But the most important thing that came out of this concept of common good and maslaha is creation of the public sphere, the creation of the state through which we have these policies. And that is something that I want you all to think about. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, and this is uh, from uh, Surah 29 and verse 78. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Wa jahidu fil 
Struggle in the path of God. The word here is jihad. To do jihad. Struggle in the path of God as God deserves your struggle in His path. But the second part of that verse is so fascinating. It says, and strive for God, strive in the path of God as He expects you to strive. And then He says, He has chosen for you a path that has not placed upon you a difficulty in your religion. So it's similarly, it's a very interesting contradiction, sort of. It says that you should do your best but also says it's not difficult on you, it's become easy. So there are several verses in the Quran where it says, like in, uh, when the commandment for fasting came, that Allah does not expect to put you in burden. The last verse of Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah Ta'ala does not burden a soul without first giving them the capacity to face that burden. All these questions, these comments in the Quran, which talk about the religion being easy, have been used by the ulama to justify the concept of maslaha which means